come for this uh, impulse uh, group and I want to give you a small impulse into social entrepreneurship and as well how you transform challenges into opportunities for social entrepreneurship. And that's what I've been doing for the last almost 15 years now, I would say. And I want to, first of all, take you on a small journey um, to understand my own background, where I've come from and, and where we're going today. And hopefully it can inspire you and a lot of examples that can inspire you, what you can do. Um, to transform challenges into opportunities for social entrepreneurship. So what you see here is me, yeah, 2006, and I went, instead of the German military service, to Uganda as a volunteer for one year, and that's where my journey started after high school. And I saw children there in the orphanage that were not able to continue going to school after primary school and would end up on the streets. And I started a sponsorship program for the children that families in Europe would support them to go to boarding schools and continue their education. I came back and studied after, but over the years, more and more kids would finish primary school and could not continue going to school. So there was a need every year, every year it would continue. And I started an NGO in Germany in 2009 that would manage those uh, sponsorships. And what happened with the children over the years? They grew up, they finished high school, the first generation in 2013, but then couldn't find jobs because there's a high youth unemployment rate in Uganda and they were also not able to go to university because the tuition fees are extremely high in Uganda compared to the income. So the goal of youth being educated to yeah, sustain themselves was not met. And that was the point for me in 2013 to go back to Uganda and sit together with the youth and see what can we actually do to solve that problem. And the answer was clear, actually, what, what is needed is a space for young people in Uganda to create their own jobs, to come up with enterprises that would create jobs. And that's what we did in 2014. We started SINA, or also called the Social Innovation Academy, and that is today the first community that was created. It started very small, but over the years has grown into a community with a community approach as well, whereby the young people from marginalized, difficult backgrounds, so not just the orphans that have grown up, but all sorts of marginalized people from difficult backgrounds from the ages of 18 to 30 years, have come to um, this community in Uganda and go through a self-organized approach that allows them in the end to gain the skills and the expertise they need to create their own enterprises. And what we have created is kind of a five-step step model that allows the people to unleash their potentials and in the end leave with their own social enterprises established. And it starts with what we call the confusion stage because people come from a more traditional educational background where often they have failed, people that have dropped out of school, people also who are refugees, people who have grown up in poverty, people who have dropped out of school um, very early on, who we collect with the confusion stage to allow them to set their own goals, to overcome their limiting beliefs, to allow them to see that they can be in charge of their own lives, that studying or education is not for somebody else, not for grades, but for themselves. And to set their own goals. And people, for example, who are refugees, who might have the limiting belief that my life is already over because I'm a refugee now, with that mindset, they will be having difficulties to achieve anything. But with setting their own goals and being able to work on them step by step, they can actually achieve a lot. And then the key component is the self-organization, that after that first three months of our training, the people take up responsibilities within the community to run and manage everything that is needed, and that allows them to gain the skills they need step by step for their own enterprises. And when people take up responsibilities, ideas naturally emerge. When you take this and this, maybe we can combine it and we can try this, and why not make this as a water filter also for communities outside since we have this community here that is being supplied by water in this way. And ideas come up and they are being tested in a boot camp and then incubated to become social enterprises. So not just any kind of enterprise, but social businesses or social enterprises defined as by Professor um, Mohamed Yunus, businesses that not just maximize profits, but businesses that really solve challenges in the communities. Businesses that have the primary goal to create value for the community, for the society, for the environment, but in a way that it is through a business model that can be replicated. 
And so I want to give you some few examples of how this actually can look like. And this one is a very um, special story for me because the young lady you see there from Uganda is actually one of the students who started in the orphanage that also my journey started in um, 15 years ago. Her name is Joan, and she grew up in the orphanage in Uganda. Um, and the orphanage is close to Lake Victoria in a walking distance. So there's a lot of mosquitoes. And as a child herself, she was suffering a lot from malaria. Then she was, after primary school, taken up by our sponsorship program, finished high school, and then after high school came to Sina, went through the program, and in the end started to see her own difficult past, past as a way to gain courage and in a way to create a social enterprise. So it's kind of like an antagonistic asset, something that was within her that she could use to help others maybe not have to go through the same difficult circumstances as herself. So she was deeply connected with the topic of malaria, which is the biggest killer in sub-Saharan Africa for children below the age of five. And there's not really a solution, there's no vaccination, and children are dying every day. So what she did was, or we developed together an idea of an everyday product, a soap, which is being sold primarily to the tourism industry, but also abroad, that is allowing a higher profit margin and with that profit margin, the sales can happen into the villages where normal people could not afford this soap at the same price as any other ordinary soap, but has the added advantages of having ingredients that repel mosquitoes through natural uh, ways. So it is fighting malaria through an innovative approach and a social business model. And she has gone on to now have her own factory um, and has spoken at the World Economic Forum and has gone from a very young, um, shy, often to a powerful uh, social entrepreneur, using her own background as kind of the strength for her business. And another few ideas have come up with the topic of how I would say waste is only waste if you waste it. You do not need so much capital to start a social enterprise, but you need resources. And many resources are sometimes available all around us if we think outside the box, if we think creatively, we can use them to start a business, even without much um, financial resources. And that's also what we did when we started Sina, and many social enterprises have taken up that idea of recycling, upcycling. For example, here you see plastic bottles, which we have transformed into bricks. The bottles are being packed with soil really, really tightly, and in the end, they form bricks that can be used for construction. So by now there's uh, countless buildings that have been constructed out of plastic bottles and it has become a social enterprise that is training other communities to do that as well as constructing um, houses in Uganda and other African countries so far. And they haven't stopped there. They have tried to innovate further. What other materials out of waste can we use to create um, building materials? And some of the solutions are here, for example, a roof out of old car tires and a roof out of old uh, plastic water containers. And especially in Uganda, in the country where there's hardly any waste management systems. Waste is just thrown everywhere or piled up and burned, and this can be an, a solution, but also a mindset shift that we can see waste differently as a resource and not just as a problem, and can make it a, a starting point for a social enterprise. And in that idea, another enterprise came up that is actually using, what you see, eggshells and plastic bags to create a flooring solution and tiles primarily out of eggshells. Eggshells that are normally just dumped in the environment is a wonderful resource um, that can be used when crushed and almost grinded as a resource for, for construction. And another idea came up, another social enterprise called Chimuli Fashionability, who are uh, using fashion and accessories, or producing fashion and accessories, and are employing as well people with disabilities. That's why the name Fashionability. And their flagship product has been using um, old cement bags, old um, cement and uh, rice and sugar sacks, and have even designed a rain jacket out of only sugar sacks that is waterproof, that has made it already even up to an exhibition at the United Nations uh, General Assembly 
as an example for, for sustainable fashion. And when you have the goal to solve a problem and not just maximize profits, you see many opportunities, what else, and you, you solve your own problems all the time. So they were highly affected by the start of the pandemic because they were selling a lot to tourism and the tourism industry completely died in Uganda. And then there was a new challenge. Since they're working with people with disabilities, many of them who are hearing impaired, who uh, need to lip read or who need to see the facial expressions, were not able to do that when you have a, a mask covering your mouth. So out of that own need to be able to communicate with their own workers, they came up with a mask that has like a see-through inlet out of plastic that allows still the protection to be there, but also to lip read and to see facial expressions. And they were amongst the first ones in the world to do that. And all of a sudden it went almost viral. They were featured live on BBC. They won an international award about Corona um, innovations. And now they're selling these masks uh, all across the world for people or organizations working with uh, hearing impaired people. Another social enterprise that has come up is not just stopping at recycling or upcycling, but taking it another step forward because plastic is still being produced and it's a big problem that is accumulating in the oceans and, and being burned everywhere, polluting the environment. So a group of our scholars, how we call them, identified, and I brought a sample here as well, if anybody's interested later, you can have a look. Um, identified there's, a, there's an ancient grass in Uganda that only seems to grow in that region of Africa that makes a perfectly natural straw for drinking. It has been used by generations earlier than the plastic was brought to Africa. But then when plastic came and it was cheap and available everywhere, the straws, the natural straws were forgotten. So they rediscovered them and are now producing natural bio and uh, compostable drinking straws and have been selling them as well to the tourism industry, but now as well are starting to, together with Sina as exploring markets internationally, are launching them on Amazon in the US and also on Amazon uh, Europe to allow sales internationally, fighting the plastic that is being um, yeah, everywhere still, but as well allowing people in Uganda to have jobs to produce the straws and even a new crop, because for now they have been naturally collected from wild um, bushes, but now they're being cultivated on a larger scale um, as a new crop, which allows income as well to be generated. And so with this, there's a lot of starting points for entrepreneurship that always start from the problem. And of course you need to understand your problem very deeply if you want to solve it, but often, what we have seen is you can also start from the strength. You do not need always to start just from the problem, especially in environments like in Uganda or as well in refugee settings where problems are so many that you can easily get overwhelmed if you try to solve all the problems. But you can start with the strength, like the example of the mosquito repellent soap was started by the strength of the own history of, of the founder. And here's another example. This is the Naki Valley Refugee Settlement, where refugees of Sina have replicated the model themselves into refugee camp. And the refugee camp is, is quite a harsh environment and can be quite dry. And people come from different parts uh, within the region, are used to a different climate. So it's difficult for them to adapt and maybe use agriculture there to plant something. And it is very dry. But it has a very big lake. So What's the asset of that refugee camp? It's a very big lake. So how can you use that? A simple idea came up. Let's start from that strength. What do we have? We have a lot of water. Um, let's just use a normal diesel-generated um, pump to pump water and cultivate areas next to the lake. And all of a sudden, they were able to produce um, a lot of yields and help families in a rotational scheme to get out of the poverty and, and produce for themselves and sell to generate some income using the strength of their, their community. Another story from the same refugee camp was identified that what else do we have in this refugee camp that can be used? And it was clear that there are thousands of goats. Goats are everywhere, people are keeping goats, rearing goats. But the idea that goat's milk can be used for anything 
has not been in anybody's mind yet. Um, for the cooling chain, it is hard to, to collect it and to use it for consumption. But if you use it into a soap again, um, it can be conserved and can create a luxury item that can actually um, yeah, generate a lot of income and create jobs within the refugee camp, starting again from a strength, what is available in the community. So today there's a business that is forming that is called Go Soapy, which is producing goat's milk soap from the goat's milk of refugees within a refugee camp. So there are many more ideas um, that have come up. I just want to highlight again three very, very briefly um, that have again started from a strength. And I hope with that I can maybe inspire you to think as well of your own strength and how you can get started. Another one is called the Totia Platform, whereby the founder herself, she was um, yeah, experiencing um, traumatic experience as a child, went through yeah, trauma in case of, of rape. And that's a big problem in many parts of the world still. And they have created a platform that allows, first of all, anonymously to um, get help, but also collecting victims of rape to take them to medical care, to be treated, to not get AIDS, to not get um, pregnant. And again, she started from her own strengths that she has gone through this difficult experience, but it doesn't need to make her a victim for life, but she can become a survivor, an activist that can actually help others not to have to go through the same experiences, or if they do, to get the best possible care. Another example of that is Chandy Chandy, the positive network, whereby a young lady that was born with HIV, she saw that there's a problem that people often forget to take their HIV drugs on time. And there's a lot of stigma around HIV. People, if they're in the workplace or at school, maybe that you don't want everybody to know that you're HIV positive and that you're taking those drugs. So what she started is a SMS platform that sends out messages to her customers who sign up on a monthly subscription. And the messages that are sent out are very positive messages, inspirational messages, that if anybody else reads them, they will not necessarily see that it's connected anyway to HIV AIDS. But the people that receive the messages know that there's a hidden message inside of those messages that allow them to remember, oh, it's time to actually take my, my drugs. And Jenny Chandy is delivering also the medication to the doorstep, wrapped into like a a present. So not that anybody sees, oh, there's something that has been delivered that is medication, but it looks and wrapped like a present that people don't know what it is. And thirdly, again, another refugee camp, um, Generous Designs Africa has been using a lot of waste that is um, plastic that is thrown everywhere to collect it, to create um, backpacks, but also with a small, simple machine to recycle the plastic and put it into new shapes for schooling and scholastic materials within the refugee camp, but also selling it outside. And again, starting from the resources that are available in the community, not just from the problem. And outside of Uganda or Africa as well, um, another story that had really fascinated me that I came across too, because um, we have been partners of the social entrepreneurship competition in tourism this year, and I worked extensively for 10 weeks uh, mentoring this young lady from well, she traveled to Mongolia just before the pandemic started and then got stuck in Mongolia for six months and was not able to leave. But that was her starting point to actually see, oh, there's much more I can do, and now started this Kusveni um, English and Nomadic Culture Camp. From her own experience, working together with Mongolians in a very remote area where they're eagle hunters, they're using eagles to hunt, which is a very fascinating tradition, but it is being slowly lost and it is... Um, yeah, very vulnerable to tourism because it can easily be distracted when too many tourists come. So she wants to find and has found already a solution how this can be a meaningful engagement that generates income for the local community as well for the tourists. And again, it started out of her own, I'm there, I'm stuck, what can I do now? I can't go home, the airports are closed. And this was the starting point for this uh, wonderful social enterprise. And as Sina overall, it started with this one community that I've showed you in the beginning. And it was the beneficiaries, how we call them, scholars, our scholars who started replicating the model. It was not our intention to go anywhere and say this is now a model that works, take it and, and implement it somewhere else, but it was the beneficiaries themselves who said, this has transformed our own lives. We have unleashed our potentials, now we know 
that we can have a purpose in life, our own background, our own story can become the passion and motivation to create a change. And so there I started to bring it to the first refugee camp, the one where I've given you a few um, stories from. And that realized for us that it is possible that the model can be replicated by the beneficiaries. And so we set out to look for more organizations, individuals that can potentially replicate the model. And that has happened now within eight communities, five refugee camps, and also communities in Congo and in Zimbabwe, and maybe next year even in Ghana, Tanzania, and maybe Cap Verde and India. So this replicating and scaling, over 45 enterprises, social enterprises have emerged until today that are still existing. Some examples I've given you already, and close to 300 jobs have been created. But that's not all. We, we want to get in the next five years to over 20 communities, and from there can reach a tipping point where more communities can replicate other communities. And then exponential growth can almost happen that can use that model to help people in difficult circumstances to organize themselves and create um, social enterprises. So it is a self-organized driven approach that comes from the strength of the people themselves. So with that, my question to you is, what, what can you create? Um, if people in Uganda or in many parts of the world can start using very simple resources like waste or a lake or their own traumatic experiences to start a social enterprise, um, what, what can you create? And often it, it has to be that we need to think creatively of, of our own resources. Sometimes we don't really see them because um, maybe other people have them as well, but we have our unique strength, a combination of things that nobody else has, and how can we use them to maybe start from a strength and not just from a problem, or connecting our strength to the problems. And most importantly, we need to dream big, but then also start small. And most importantly, we need to start now. Like my own story has started over 15 years ago, it was not a big vision, I need to go there and do this, but it was from one problem to the other. First, I didn't want to go for a military service, I looked for a solution. Found children in an orphanage that could not go to school, looked for a solution. Children finished high school, could not go to university, could not find jobs, next solution. So it can become a, a flow of events that can lead you from one thing to the other if you're open for these opportunities. If you are into social entrepreneurship that you want to create a change and not just maximize profits. So with this, I would love to encourage you to start something today as well, or tomorrow, as soon as you can. It can be very small. You don't have to build a school to teach somebody something. And it can develop over a long, longer period of time. You don't have to quit your job or go all in from day one, but it can develop over a long period of time. And as you can see with many examples, how it can be possible. So with this, I finish my small input because I wanted to have enough time that we can rather also discuss and answer questions or um, yeah, see if anybody has a specific strength. Maybe we can even here try to turn into a potential social enterprise. So um, yeah, so much of the input and I really, really welcome a discussion. I don't think there's a second microphone, but maybe we can, can go around with this one. Thank you. So, yeah, questions? Thank you. Um, I have a question about the, glo uh, the Global Movement page. Um, how are you going to reach those, uh, the growth in five years? Um, yeah, how are we going to reach that? We don't want to scale the organization like many organizations do that set up businesses, branches in new countries, new uh, regions. For us, we want to scale the impact, not the organization. So in that way, the model is now, as it has happened naturally or already, to allow people from different parts of Uganda, different parts of Africa, different parts of the world that are interested in the model to come out for now to Uganda, to go through one of the communities for nine months that allows them to experience it firsthand, that they ex um, have this transformation within them. They come to us when they are maybe in a state of survival, 
not thinking so much about social entrepreneurship or seeing opportunities in their life, but they have potential within them. And that potential will come out in that nine months. And then at the end, we train them with the skills and tools as well to replicate the model uh, somewhere else, which are elements of self-organization, coaching, mentoring, um, finance, um, fundraising, everything they might need to replicate that. And then they go out back to their own community where they create their own community. And it becomes part of a community of communities whereby also best practices are being collected from all the communities that we have to collectively improve the model. And for now, everything still goes through the first community, which is kind of the community that is the most established. But within the next few years, the first communities will be at the level and point where they can also replicate without it going to a central point. And at that point is when it can almost exponentially uh, grow from then 20 maybe to within a few years, 30, within a few years, 50. And we have created as well a license that kind of defines quality standards that we also see. It is locally registered organizations, but it is still having a similar quality in all the different uh, organizations while they're locally owned and uh, run. Um, so we heard a lot about the results of SENA Academies. Uh, I wonder uh, if you can tell a little more about the day-to-day -day life. How do the people who live there work there together and um, yeah, develop their ideas? Uh, yeah, so maybe one example how this looks like that people actually gain the skills they need for their own social enterprises later, because again, many people come to us not with a career yet, not with much education, formal education that they have uh, received, but rather, yeah, from difficult backgrounds. So people have roles within the community, and we use a system called holacracy. Maybe the one or the other have ever heard about it. It's distributing authority, not like a management hierarchy where you have bosses and subordinates and you follow orders, but a way how complexity is organized similar than maybe nature is organizing complexity. So like the body has individual cells which are autonomous, but they're connected within, for example, organs which are also autonomous, which make up the whole body in the end and make function everything collectively. So within that system, the scholars take up roles as well. They have clear accountabilities, they know what they need to do. The roles can change, people can select their own roles according to their own interest. So will that people kind of create their own curriculum Somebody might be more into marketing and take up roles there, another one might be more into finance, another one might be into the training, and first time being a participant of the training, second time maybe a co-facilitator, third time maybe co-facilitator with another, um, and even up to the point where they organize the training. And others might be more into logistics, so for example the community you have seen that is on top of the hill, the first community, um, there's always a problem of water, because on top of the hill there's no water that um, is easily reachable on underground, so rainwater is collected. But there's a dry season that can be up to three months sometimes without rain, and then the water dries up, even in the collected tanks. So there's a role holder, for example, somebody that is in charge of water for the community. And that person needs to, when the water runs out, deal with, for example, 70 people that normally live there who are angry, who don't have water, who, um, yeah, are like customers almost in a business because he's in charge of supplying them with the water. So he will have to learn or she will have to learn how to deal with them, how to plan, how to budget, how to come up with new solutions, all the kind of things that also you will do when you run or start your own business. The name of the system is called Holacracy.
Yeah, so let me paraphrase the question for also the people online where I think cannot hear your question. Um, so the question was, holacracy, is it enabling, how does it yeah, allow for innovation, how does it um, maybe contradict uh, more static organizations which are lacking um, maybe innovation, right? Okay, so yeah, it's a system that we have really, well, first of all, we kind of developed something similar ourselves from the start, because it was clear as well, me as the, the main founder coming from Europe, I cannot be the one that imposes something on people in Africa that is unfortunately done a lot, but that doesn't work or should not be the case. So it was clear it needs to be a ground up approach that people actually bring up their own solutions from the start and from the organizational design, that's how we designed it from the start. Then at some point we came across Holacracy, which has done the same, um, started in the US, but they have even made it into a framework. There's a, a constitution that is adapted to the law in the US that you can ratify within an organization and, and kind of make it official as well. So we thought there's more structure in that system, although it's similar to what we have developed ourselves. It has very clear processes. It is um, able to change roles, adapt roles, and really finding a way to hold each other accountable. So that's for us one of the main reasons why it has worked so well, because we're using it one as an empowerment tool that people take up responsibilities and are able to grow within um, the, the work they're doing. So really a hands-on kind of educational approach. Um, but also it allows the people to bring up new solutions all the time because there's not, you don't need to ask for permission. So if you have a role, it kind of specifies the purpose within your role. Everything is purpose-driven and you do whatever you feel necessary that allows you to energize your purpose. There's a few things maybe that are limitations that can be defined, but within that purpose, people come up with new ideas all the time. And then there's a decision-making process that is not a hierarchy. You don't have to ask for permission, but also not consensus. Not everybody has to agree on the same thing, which can be a very much a blocking system if, if you have many people involved. But it works with objections, proposals and objections. And somebody can propose a different structure, a new role, something else that we should do, based on the experiences of, of the work. And then the process asks kind of a simple question, does this proposal cause any harm? Um, and if the answer is yes, the person that has this objection needs to clearly state what this harm might be. And if the answer is yes, that there might be some harm, then the proposal is not being accepted as it is, but it has to be kind of integrated and new solutions found that both um, the proposer and the objector can agree to it. But even if somebody doesn't like, or a whole lot of people don't like a new idea, but they don't have a valid objection, it is still going to be implemented. So it solves the people's problems, or they can be in charge of solving their own problems, and yeah, it can drive really innovation like that. Thank you. Um, I had a question on this topic of social entrepreneurship and social innovation in Uganda on a, like a broader level. So I know, for example, in Germany, we are still in the midst of developing structures, also associations, organizations around social entrepreneurship and social innovation. Um, so I'm wondering how is SINA involved in talking to government, to universities in Uganda itself to kind of promote enterprise entrepreneurial ac action as a tool for positive change and also solving these challenges. Um, so is there more movement? Is there an ecosystem of social enterprises growing in Uganda or is it really mostly a social innovation academy? Yeah, so there is of course an ecosystem that has formed and I think Uganda is quite a favorable country for entrepreneurship. It was even named the most entrepreneurial country in the world a few years ago by some studies. So a lot of people are into entrepreneurship. They want to use entrepreneurship as a way to generate income. A lot of it is informal. So hardly businesses are being registered, but people are selling stuff on the street, uh, creating something as a small income generation. But entrepreneurship is really in the minds of, of a lot of people. Um, so there's also an association that has formed between different hubs, labs, and organizations that support entrepreneurship, which is called Startup Uganda, and Sina is also one of the founding members, uh, where we do have a lot of exchange and, and conversations with other organizations within Uganda, for example, that are in the same space. But I think what makes us unique is most of the other organizations start like most 
accelerators, incubators in the world from already quite established businesses that are probably going to succeed even without that lab or that acceleration program because they have already a track record, they have already something that is working. Well, we're starting from people that nobody would ever accept in those kind of accelerators, people that come from a survival state, that come from difficult backgrounds, and first go through that kind of educational approach. So with that, we do have a lot of other connections to more the educational space within Uganda and the world. But within education, it can be quite limiting that, for example, the national curriculum in Uganda has um, a format that can tell you what you can do and what you cannot do. And many things that we do would not fit into that curriculum, unfortunately. So we're not kind of a school or a training institution, but we are yeah, kind of in the informal education, which has worked well for SENA because it allows us to be more kind of radical in the way that we are different from the formal school system. But it also makes it hard to find the touching points with the formal education for now. But the goal long term is once there are many SENA communities that are running in a refugee camp, for example, SENA community is running on about $1,000 a month for about 50 to 70 people living there, organizing themselves, even with a joint meal, maybe a joint breakfast every day, because there's not really staff. People are self-organized. There's not much um, yeah, costs that are normally there in a school, for example, runs on a budget that is probably 10, 15 times higher than that. But people within SENA, within a short time, are able to have something meaningful that they can use directly and create value for themselves and for the community, solve their own problems within, for example, a refugee camp. So once we have proven that enough and many more senior communities have come up, we hope that one day the conversations can be there with, for example, educational ministries. Um, how can we adapt that also more into the formal system? Or can the formal system also transform somehow that it is more, I would say, lean and able to adapt to the needs. Because right now people are graduating, even from university in Uganda, without having much possibilities to find a job. So something needs to change. But the change, I think, cannot happen from within the system, but it needs to happen from outside the system. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. Like there's a famous quote by Buckminster Fuller. Um, if you want to change something, you have to make the old model obsolete um, instead of fighting the existing. So that's kind of what we're trying to do. Does that answer the question? Any other questions? Also, uh, comments or something? Yeah. I've seen the picture of the diesel pump uh, in, in this camp, uh, and I, I thought, uh, why don't they use uh, solar engine and uh, uh, have no to pay, not to pay for, for fuel and have less waste, waste and less problems with me mechanics? Higher investment is sure, but I, I think maybe it's a good idea to, to think about it. Yeah, for sure. Solar is a, is a wonderful solution. Um, but like you already mentioned, it has much more starting costs. So the investment is much higher. So to get started, People are having difficulties to raise, for example, the funds to, even if it is just potentially a few hundreds or thousands of euros or dollars to have a solar uh, water pump. But the generator is uh, very affordable. A used generator like that might be even less than 100 euros for sure. So it is much easier to, to get started. But once you get started and something works, then of course you can easily grow from there. So in the long run, I don't think they will continue using that um, diesel-generated pump, but they already have upgraded on more efficient pumps, but still not yet solar. But maybe one day they will. Any other comments or also ideas maybe how you can transform your own strength into an idea for social entrepreneurship? That would be also very interesting. Holacracy. Um, holacracy is combined out of two words, I think. Um, I'm not the one that made that word, but um, there's this idea of holon, something that is kind of like more holistic, uh, comes from that same word, I think. Um, and then cracy, like democracy and other cracies, so kind of an organized system around it. So 
basically a system that allows us to structure our work without yeah, a management hierarchy, but rather distributed authority. So the question, if, if we're thinking more long-term or short-term with the example of the lake and the pump, um, of course we want to think long-term as much as possible, um, but not in the sense of a sustainability, because I think for social entrepreneurship we don't even want to be sustainable, because sustainability means that the problem still exists many years from, from, from now to come, but the goal is to solve the problem, so it should actually solve the problem until the problem is not existent anymore. Um, so that's the starting point where we try to think of from the beginning. How can we really solve the problem that it doesn't exist anymore? Of course, there can be side effects that maybe new problems emerge along the way. Like you say, if, the, if you would now use this on a large scale and thousands of people are using the water from the lake to irrigate, that it creates uh, potentially new problems. Um, and we try to maximize the positive impacts from the start, but sometimes it's not always easy to think long-term, especially for the people that are on the ground suffering because they need food now. They don't so much care about tomorrow if they're going to yeah, not have food today. Um, but I think from a systemic point, it, it works quite well that in, this, in the self-organized space, things are falling into their place. So um, if there's new problems emerging and people are having this mindset of how can we solve problems, there's going to be new solutions as well coming along the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did we register the first organization and how do we get financed? Um yeah, the first one is, is an NGO that is still existing today. It's still running that sponsorship program. Um, registered in Berlin as a traditional, in Germany, NGO, Verein, um, Gemeinnützig, so like charity. Um, but then when SINA started to emerge, it was first incorporated within that structure. But then once it started to replicate, uh, we saw that a new structure is needed that is more also kind of a social business. So we have registered now since a few years as well um, uh, gemeinnützige uh, GmbH, so uh, charitable business or social business that allows us as well to generate revenue as well as to accept donations that is much more favorable also for this approach. So we do have an ambition to become a social business as defined by Mohamed Yunus that we are generating 100% through our own revenue, which we are not yet there. So for now it is a lot of um, family foundations in the German-speaking countries, um, as well as some businesses who have supported us for the construction out of plastic bottles. For example, there have been some um, plastic bottle producers who have supported us with their CSR efforts. Um, so, and from the start, another question you had, how did we get started with the first finances? Because it was not something new, but it was a continuation of something existent, it somehow worked out quite well. So there was about, 16 students that had been sponsored already um, from the first uh, year that had gone through the sponsorship program, and they had 16 sponsor families, and some of them as well were entrepreneurs. So they were the first ones I went to and said, look, we have this problem now, we don't know what they're going to do now when they finish high school, we have this new idea, we want to create this SENA. And some of them understood, like, okay, this sounds interesting, I would be able to support it, but you need to find others as well who support it, I don't want to be the only one. So that's the biggest fear of something new and crazy that People don't want to be the only ones supporting it. But with that commitment, I was able to then talk to others. Look, we have this idea. We have already some people who have committed. If we find others who also commit to it, we can make it happen. 
And that way I was also able to convince other people outside of the existing um, support network we had to um, help us start it. It's important to yeah, have kind of a track record that you have something to show that can then make it easier for the fundraising as well. Any other questions, comments? Yeah? So the question, how do we choose, or how do the entrepreneurs choose the problems they're solving? Mm -hmm. And if we have preferences for the problems. It is quite self-organized in a way that we kind of don't limit the, the, the scholars to go in any direction, but as long as they, it, has, it solves a social problem. So if somebody wants to go in the direction of producing, for example, very common in Uganda, um, charcoal for, for cooking fuel, which is cutting down trees and then kind of um, yeah, burning them away, that it makes coal for cooking, um, that is a very lucrative business and you could probably easily start it uh, without much resources because you can go out and cut trees, but it's not very um, sustainable and helpful for the environment. So as long as there's no businesses that are clearly having a negative impact, they're free to go into any direction. So we have businesses from the construction to health to even arts. Um, did we have the case of if there was any enterprise that came up that we disapproved of? Not really. Because um, in the beginning we had to kind of set incentives for people to think outside the box, to do something innovative. Because with the entrepreneurship people are used to, it is the common things they see that they also want to do. So the first ideas that came up were, and that's most of the other programs in Uganda have the similar problem. Or if you have competitions, um, which also we have run, for example, Social Impact Award in Uganda, many ideas that are being submitted are always the same things that people see. Uh, rearing chicken, rearing pigs, uh, riding a motorcycle, uh, driving a car or a taxi, things like that, that of course can generate income, but it's not really kind of creating a business. So initially we tried to incentivize that by helping people to come up with an idea that would solve a problem. And if they generated revenue through that, we would top up the revenue they had, kind of double it if it solved the a social problem, and even triple it if it solved the social and environmental problem. But that was just an incentive to get going. And from there, we have stopped that long time ago because now it has kind of self-organized again that people within the community feel we are there to solve problems and come up with ideas that now naturally um, do that. And people inspire each other as well and learn from each other. So at the moment, for years now, we really didn't have any enterprise ideas that would not fall into the category of social enterprise. Sometimes maybe they are um, within the process can be improved and, and can have more impact if they change something, like the business you saw with the fashion um, out of waste materials, who then started to also employ people with disabilities so they have an environmental and a social impact. There's another question. We don't teach so much, so the question was what is the training program? Um, in the first stage, it is three months where it is more an organized training. Um, and then after that, the training is kind of people taking up roles and responsibilities. So there's a few sessions once in a while to give some inputs, but mostly people are working within the community to take up roles and that give them the skills and they grow through that. And then when they start business ideas, then there's again a boot camp that takes the ideas through and, and tests them and sees can it uh, find customers, can it have a market, um, how can it iterate and change that it can, can survive outside. And within the, th and then overall, there's not really a fixed time frame. So it might be nine months, and some people have gone through nine months and then left with their own business, but others have stayed on for years because they become part of the community. They take up roles and responsibilities, and as long as they continue growing and continue having these roles, they become part of the team, 
And it's beneficial for the organization as well as for them because they continue growing and one day they come up with their own ideas and leave with their business. So it's not a fixed timeline. There's also no certificate or any kind of thing at the end that you graduate. You graduate when you have your own business and you leave with your own job, basically. But within the first three months, yes, there is a lot of kind of training in, uh, inputs where there's a lot about coaching, like helping you to overcome your limiting beliefs, as well as um, setting goals, and then some sometimes radical approaches that help people to reflect the way I've been doing things, is it still the way I want to do them in the future? For example, uh, we do something which we call comfort zone challenges. We all have our comfort zones, and within our comfort zone we don't grow much, because we're used to it and we don't grow. So to help people understand that concept and to challenge themselves to overcome the comfort zones, to grow, we, for example, in one day, give them a list of 20 items that they need to complete at least maybe 10 out of. And on the list are things, so they go to the capital Kampala on busy streets, so on, on that list are things like laying down on a busy street for 30 seconds. So things that are not difficult to do, but are scary because what are people going to think? In a busy street, I'm going to lay down in the street, what are people going to think? Um, or starting in the middle of a street to sing or to dance, or going into a shop and asking for a job, or things like that, small things that help people to overcome kind of their limiting beliefs, I can't do this, um, and going out of their comfort zone. And then we also take them through uh, kind of a more, you could say, uh, physical challenge as well uh, with a partner organization that they overcome as well a bit physical um, challenges just to see that I can actually get out of my comfort zone and then that's one of the most powerful days they have and people love because it's the starting point of this transformation that they start to challenge themselves afterwards. All right, I think also we are, yeah, time is already up, so yeah, it has been a pleasure. Um, my warm invitation, if anybody is interested or passing by in Uganda, visit us, you can even take part. We had always open for, for volunteers, for people working with different enterprises, with SINA as a whole, even in refugee camps, anywhere, the possibility is there. So invitation, if you come by, um, say hi, and otherwise in the next uh, one and a half days, um, I look forward for many more discussions and um, thank you for, for coming and uh, have a great day.